I had vaguely heard of Hugh Nibley, I think, growing up uh, in California. He was sort of a figure of devotion among some of the Latter-day Saints that I, that I knew. When I was a junior in high school, I was only about 15 or 16, so I think I had begun to read some things. So, you know, obviously when I heard that Hugh Nibley was speaking, I wanted to be there. But that's where the real mystique took over. You know, I just thought he was fascinating, this freewheeling, careening trip through the, <laughs> through the ancient world. And it was just absolutely mind-boggling to me. Well, he was obviously eccentric. I mean, the talks were scattered, as, as they often were. As, as, you know, as I got to know him better and better, I knew that was just his recognizable trademark. That, but it was part of what made him so fascinating, was that he, he knew everything. He could make connections between widely varying cultures and languages and civilizations. And, uh, and it was clear that it was just coming to him as he spoke. I mean, he had some plan sometimes of where he was going to go. Uh, but it was just all this stuff at his beck and call that he could bring up when he wanted to illustrate a point. And I thought, this is one of the most learned people I have, well, it is the most learned person I've ever met ever encountered and and man if I could be something like that I'd love to be well you know I know there used to be a, a a question frequently asked you know well who will who will the replacement of Hugh Nibley be and people would propose different individuals and, and I've had a few people say oh you're it my own feeling was early on there will never be another one partly because he's he was unique but also partly because of the moment he came along. I mean, he was the only thing like that there was. Now he's got a lot of people who, who sort of followed in his footstep to a certain extent. In his day, you have to remember that, you know, when he was born in 1910, church was basically an agricultural operation, I mean, an agrarian population. A, a small city in, in, you know, Salt Lake, but not very big, not exactly the crossroads of the West. And a lot of our people were in little farming communities in Utah and Idaho and Arizona. We didn't have anybody who was really plugged into the world of, you know, sophisticated elite scholarship. Um, but Hugh came from outside all of that. You know, he's born in Portland. He was raised in California. He went to UCLA and UC Berkeley. Uh, was at Claremont and so on before he came to BYU. And he, he. Um, he was plugged into that world in a way that almost nobody in the church was at that time. And so he was sort of a harbinger of things to come, I think. But my, my own feeling was that Hugh wasn't going to be replaced so much by an individual as by, and he would have hated this, a committee. <laughs> not, not necessarily an organized committee, but a group of people. So farms, the old farms, which became the Maxwell Institute before it changed courses in 2012, um, I thought, well, maybe this is it. This is, this is the corporate, the, the, the collective successor to Hugh Nibley. If there are successors to Hugh today, in terms of apologetics, it would be collectively the three organizations, maybe some others, but those are the three that come to mind, FAIR and, uh, and Interpreter and Book of Mormon Central. And I think Hugh would be very pleased to see what they're doing. I, I was told, uh, Lou Midgley told me a story of, of being at Hugh's house when he was in his terminal illness, wasn't feeling very well, couldn't get out, and he was complaining to Lou that, uh, that he'd been forgotten. Nobody remembers him. Uh, and for example, he expected the next issue of the, the Farms Review, which I was the editor of, and, but it hadn't come, it hadn't come, so he'd been forgotten. And while Hugh was there, the mail came and the new issue of the Farms Review was in it, and Hugh was just delighted you know, that, that the work was still going on. He got such a kick out of it. You know, one of our concerns is simply there are a lot of people who don't know the name Hugh Nibley anymore. I'm surprised, actually, I mention him in my classes once in a while when an anecdote comes to mind that I'll say, have you heard of Hugh Nibley? And I'm surprised that still quite a few do remember him. Uh, students who were hardly born when he passed away. Um, but, um, but still, a lot don't know him. They certainly haven't read him. His books aren't widely available. He's not cited anymore. And also, to an extent, I, I run into people who say, oh yeah, Hugh Nibley, he's been debunked years ago. And I, I missed the memo. Um, now, I, Hugh would be the first one to have told you, oh yeah, you know, my stuff won't, won't hold up forever. You know, scholarship changes, new sources come forward. He says, don't hold me accountable for, he used to say this often, don't hold me accountable for anything I wrote more than three years ago or five years ago. 
Uh, so he would say now, you know, if you haven't made any progress beyond me, what's wrong with you? Um, but uh, but um, we felt that this book was important both to remind people that there was a Hugh Nibley and to remind people that he was a remarkable figure. I mean, just a kind of academic comet that streaked across the, the LDS sky. Uh, and he shouldn't be forgotten. He, there's never been anyone quite like him. And he sort of invented a whole field of, of studies of the gospel. And, and so we think the book and the attendant materials are really, really important that uh, people need to be reminded of him.